Nasiria. Yes. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Namaste. Aslam alaikum. Good evening or good morning to all of you, depending on the time zone in which you live. Um, we are so pleased to have people in this meeting from different time zones from all over the world. I'm Ashiria Anwud from the Netherlands. I'm a second year student at Erasmus University, majoring in economics, business and society. Um, our regular moderator, Shakira, will return next Sunday. Um, today, this is the 160th edition of the Zoom public meeting, and we wish to sincerely thank all of you who have contributed in whatever way to the success of this ongoing Pan-Indo-Caribbean and Pan-Indian diaspora global project. Because for 159 unbroken continuous weeks, we have been here every single Sunday, um, and in the past three years and four months, we have featured over 647 presenters from all over the world speaking on 159 topics. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a weekly forum being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center, which is a legally registered and research and publishing company operating since 2010. In order to continue this weekly program and to make it even bigger and better, we are asking you kindly to give us your suggestions as well as donations. Uh, please contact Dr. Mahabir for details about this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our moderator this evening is Shalima Mohammed. She is the co-director of the Zoom platform and also a business teacher and researcher from Trinidad and Tobago. She obtained her master's degree in business psychology from Franklin University in the USA. Shalima, welcome. Thank you, Shiria. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Namaste and a very warm welcome to all of you. I want to say thank you so much for choosing to be here with us. This public meeting will take the usual form of a panel presentation with speakers presenting, followed by Q&A. This meeting is being recorded live and would be uploaded later on YouTube permanently for posterity. We are live streaming on the YouTube channel of the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. I want to say welcome to all of you on YouTube. To avoid intrusions from trolls, Rabin Ram Singh, our IT manager, has muted everyone. Speakers, please do not admit anyone, do not unmute anyone, and do not allow anyone to share your screen. Thank you so much. Over the next two hours, we will be addressing the topic, decolonizing the Indian mind in the diaspora. Decolonization is a multifaceted concept that encompasses a broad range of social, political, and cultural processes aimed at dismantling the structures and legacies of colonialism. It signifies a transformative endeavor, which seeks to challenge and rectify the historical injustices, power imbalances, and cultural dominance imposed by colonial powers on colonized peoples and territories. Decolonization involves reclaiming, and we want to find out today, to what extent have Indians and people of Indian origin reclaimed indigenous and traditional knowledge, practices, and identities while confronting and subverting the hegemonic narratives and systems that perpetuate oppression and equality. So let me move right on to introducing our first speaker. And this is Mr. Irfan Pulani of India, who is now based in Costa Rica. He's an international lawyer working on the Kashmir crisis in South Asia. He is serving as the Secretary General of the Indian Reunification Association, promoting peace and unity among the former states of British India. Welcome, Mr. Pulani. You can speak for a minimum of 15 minutes, maximum of 20. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shalima, ma'am. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon from Costa Rica. Uh, it's an honor. Thank you so much for giving this space to be here today. As uh, Shalima ma'am rightly mentioned, I am presently speaking from Costa Rica, where I just graduated with my master's last week. I was a student of University for Peace, which is a United Nations mandated institute. And I completed my master's in international law and settlement of disputes program. And to give a quick background about me, I'm a lawyer based in Delhi. I'm originally from South India, I'm from Kerala but I also work in Kashmir since 2019. I run an independent peace building research project called the Kashmir Journal. 
and I explored a possible resolution to the decades old Kashmir crisis. So as uh, Shalima ji rightly gave a quick uh, intro to the our topic here today, it's about decolonizing the Indian minds. Uh, I am not an expert in this topic, but I have academic passion towards decolonization. I have extensively researched on the partition of India. So that's what led me to this platform here. And I was directly referred by uh, my friend James Boston, who is the chairperson, chairman of Association of Former British Colonies. And Dr. Mahavir uh, has been in touch with uh, our organization, uh, the Association of Former British Colonies, AFBC, for a while now. And uh, he has given this opportunity and he frequently invites our members to attend this uh, great platform. Thank you so much for that. So to step into our topic, uh, I would like to begin by noting that uh, in his 2022 Independence Day address, the Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, gave a clarion call for shedding the colonial era mindset, which is still entrenched in the psyche of many Indians, even after 75 years of independence. The decolonization that unfolded in the 20th century was a significant event in world history. This momentous event commenced shortly after the Second World War, when the colonial powers exhausted the wars, struggled to maintain control over distant lands. This provided an opportunity for colonized countries to break free from bondage, aided by the ideals of liberty, equality, and self-determination exposed by the Western world. Although colonialism ended in its traditional form, it persisted in various cases such as neo-colonialism, imperialism, and ideological hegemony. To understand our culture and rich heritage, it is essential to acknowledge this background. We must not solely focus on the 19th century, but delve deeper into the last 5,000 years of Indian history. My perspective of speaking here today is not specifically concentrated on a decolonization aspect, but I'm trying to imply and invite your attention to uh, the colonization perspectives, how our civilization, how the Indian civilization was uh, engineered, the colonization was engineered within our civilization and our country. For instance, uh, uh, did you know that in 1661, the islands of Bombay were given as dowry to King Charles II of England upon his marriage to Catherine the uh, Brangaza of Portugal? It is vital to recognize that women in India held a higher status along, long before 1920 when women in the United States earned the right to vote and contest. The Orientalists who studied our society may have been influenced by colonial projects, interpreting our culture in a manner that suited colonization. Colonial rule spanning two centuries left an indelible impact on Indian society, influencing the way people walk, talk, dress, and how society is regulated by rules, laws, and directives. Foreign rulers redefined India's social, cultural, and political landscape, leading us to become defensive on certain issues and fostering misconceptions in our minds. Consequently, we often measure ourselves against Western concepts without fully understanding our own. English being the lingua franca of India today reflects the influence of British colonial rule. Our education system from kindergarten to postgraduate studies was modeled on the recommendations of Lord Macaulay. Many of the laws that govern our lives today, such as the Indian Penal Code, the Constitution, and the Criminal Penal Code, which formulated, uh, were formulated during the colonial era. Even the political system, even the political system we inherited after independence bears the imprint of colonial influence as India's founding fathers were trained in parliamentary politics. British governance and administrations gave rise to a new middle class educated and steeped in colonial culture. These individuals were Indians by birth, but British in heart, and this allied culture persisted beyond independence due to our inability to dismantle British laws and administration. The civil services still hold considerable power and play a crucial role in governing the country, often being coveted as a dream job. 
the exploitative administrative structures established by the British continued in a new form, impeding in the growth of our spiritual and cultural efforts. We must reflect on what went wrong with our development, causing us to lose the initiative that the ancient era had bestowed upon us. Care must be taken when analyzing the past and bearing in with the Western civilization. Until the Renaissance in Europe, India and the Western world were relatively equal. However, the medieval period marked by feudalism and religious dominance hindered the growth of new ideas and energies, entrenching the old structures. The Renaissance in Europe liberated minds from their shackles, challenging established authority and emphasizing objective inquiry. Meanwhile, Asia became dormant and exhausted after its past achievement. Europe, which was backward in many respects, stood on the cusp of immense changes. It was during this time that India lost its inner vigor and gradually succumbed to British dominance. dominance. One reason for India's limited progress is that post-independence, we have deviated from our true nature. It has become a struggle between secular colonial India and dharma idea of Bharat. Throughout history, the primary aim of human endeavor in India has been dharma, which is righteous, righteousness, artha, wealth, kama, worldly pressure, and moksha, which means salvation. While artha encompasses much more than mere wealth, the pursuit of profit was never considered disgraceful. What mattered was the ethical means by which the wealth was acquired and utilized. When a nation behaves contrary to its inner nature, long-term progress becomes impossible. The day Indians are guided by Indian thought will be the day when India is truly liberated. Swami Vivekananda once said, India must conquer the world and nothing less is my ideal. Our eternal foreign policy should be the dissemination of our scriptures to the nations of the world. One of the reasons for India's decline was our withdrawal, enclosing ourselves like oysters and refusing to share our treasures with other races beyond the Aryan fold. To find our identity, we must turn into our past. This past not merely be contemplated, but felt within us, pulsating in our veins. Our country, ha our country has three names, Bharat, which signifies the land of knowledge, Hindustan, denoting the Hindi-speaking regions of the Indian subcontinent and the word India derived from the Greeks, Greeks who possibly gained their first impressions of India through Persians, dropping the hard aspirate and referring to Indians as Indoi. Dr. Radhakrishnan explained that the term Hindu originally had territorial, not creedal significance, implying the residence in a well-defined geographical area. When we speak of knowledge, it encompasses an understanding of our inner selves and our relationship with the external world, Hindustan, Hindu, and Hindi. Western democracy is built on the rights and duties of individuals, cherishing ideas of freedom, equality, and fraternity. Dharma, on the other hand, encompasses the Indian way of life and conduct where rights and duties transcends the artificial antagonism created by selfish views of the world. Dharma re-establishes their profound and eternal unity. Dharma forms the foundation of democracy, which Asia must recognize as the key distinction between the soul of Asia and the soul of Europe. Democracy is here to stay in India, but a change in attitude is needed. Often the meaning of rights is interpreted in terms of personal gain, Dharma, however, calls for the practice of righteousness at all times, transcending the notions of rights and duties. Instead, it, it engenders a transformation from self-centeredness to a mindset focused on serving others. By, remo by removing the ego and hatred from our minds, we foster harmony and unity among fellow human beings. So what is religion? Sri Aurobindo aptly remarked, there is no word as plastic and as uncertain in its meaning as the word religion. Religion as understood in its Semitic cultures revolves around belief in historical prophet and adherence to a holy book. Salvation is often seen as possible as only through accepting the authority of their prophet and holy book. 
in contrast hinduism does not revolve around a prophet or a holy book it does not claim that self realization can only be achieved through a singular hindu path open mindedness and the coexistence of various schools of thought have been hallmarks of indian philosophy unfortunately we have been influenced by western thought that we have created separate religions were non existed today hinduism buddhism and jainism are perceived as distinct religions even though they represent different paths to self realization we must disentangle ourselves from the western world and refuse to let our culture be judged in an alien court under alien laws we should not compare ourselves point by point against western ideals to feel uh, either shame or pride instead we should embrace our true essence during the struggle of independence mahatma gandhi achieved remarkable success because he emerged from the masses speaking their language and continuously emphasizing our rich philosophical and cultural heritage he was deeply re- rooted in his religious beliefs as a hindu yet his understanding of religion had nothing to do with dogma or ritual indian culture he wrote is not exclusively hindu islamic or any other single identity it is a fusion of all these influences he further stated uh, i quote him i want the culture of all lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible but i refuse to be blown off by of my feet by any influenced by modern thought and contemporary currents gandhi never severed his ties and his roots instead he clung to them tenaciously he sought to restore spiritual unity of people dismantling the barriers between westernized elites and the masses a, a nation on the brink of starvation cannot embrace religion art or organization if we provide the basic necessity of life today all the grace and adornments of life will follow suit uh, this unfortunate and dispossessed millions haunted gandhi and his every action seemed to revolve around them gandhi challenged the western world and the colonial ethos by delving deep into roots of indian culture and philosophical values he not only preached indian culture and values but also embodied dumb before the world in doing so he dismantled the hegemony of colonial ideology and western superiority replacing them with the indian ideals of detachment truth self belief self belief and renunciation gandhi's hind swaraj shouldn't be seen as a political manifesto but should also be treated as a manual to initiate the process of decolonization the primary site of initiating the ritual of the recolonization is the university sadly it is the schools and universities where the colonial narratives get adopted and perpetuated instead of being contested today our entire education system both at the school and university level is completely dominated by this hegemonic narratives it serves as a kind of neo colonialism and budding minds get willingly subjugated to masses decolonization of the indian mind calls for much deschooling and unlearning it also requires developing a new language the thinking and the dialects of indian cultures and traditions and this needs to be done playfully in bits and pieces discarding all sorts of doctrine and theories and procedures and as indians uh, living abroad as indian diaspora living abroad we all have a lot of uh responsibilities in this regard in my opinion so we should start to educate ourselves and we should start to uh spread the message to the masses and that's how uh this noble mission can be achieved i i am almost about to conclude my talk but before that i want to point one more thing which came to my mind which is uh which is also connected to this topic of decolonization as i uh, mentioned in the beginning i am a deep researcher of the partition of india and i regard the partition of indian subcontinent as one of the biggest extended tool of colonization and uh, we we have been academically researching the partition and it was a clearly engineered british plan uh, uh, to partition to divide our motherland based on the uh, based on a bogus two nation theory which stated that an uh, religions defines nationalities and two religions cannot uh, coexist we we have been a civilization which have coexisted for 
5,000 years, as I mentioned. So uh, to educate ourselves about the partition and its entrenching and its expanded effects, even until today, the, the discourse of communalism in the mainland India, the, the failure of Pakistan as a country, all this can be rooted back, traced back to the, uh, to the partition of the subcontinent. So I invite all of your attention to be more aware and educate yourself about the partition of India and let's all continue this sort of academic and intellectual uh, discussions. I firmly thank uh, the organizers of this great platform and continuously look forward to attend more uh, discussions with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Irfan. That was a very interesting expose about the history of, I don't want to say colonizing thought, but um, perhaps yes. Uh, very, very um, noble of you to also bring up that Indians by birth, but British by thought continues until today. And perhaps even now Indians by birth, but American by thought even more than British. So um, at this point in time, thank you very much for all that you've shared. And I want to invite anyone from our audience who have burning questions for a fun, please go ahead and um, indicate that you would like to pose your question to him by raising your electronic hand. You can click on the reactions button at the base of your screen. And within there, you will find the electronic hand. If you raise your hand, I'll be able to call upon you. Yes, Jay, go ahead, please. Unmute your mic. You're muted. Can you unmute your mic, please? Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. <laughs> Very well done, <laughs> as a teacher would tell, uh, tell the student. Uh, the thoughts are mutual, and I've read quite a bit, and decolonizing is, is a big issue. And an Indian uh, anywhere in the world is, a, is still an Indian. And we have to understand where the roots of India is. And Mahatma Gandhi was the person that really put this on track in his days when he fought the British Raj. So thank you very much for your well you know, scripted and more reading for us and the aspects that you touched. Thank you. Well said, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Khan, hi, yes, go ahead, please. Please unmute your mic. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Pulani, for your talk. It's, um, it's, it's very well framed, very well thought out, very well articulated. Um, and um, <clears throat> I want to go, however, to the comment that Shalima made, which is, to some extent, the recolonization or neocolonization, for those of us who live in this part of the world anyway, has been Americanized. So it was like moving from British colonization, getting independence, wondering how to frame yourself, how to understand yourself, how to develop economic and political systems and social attitudes and so on. And in that kind of vulnerable walking in the quicksand um, status, the American mm -hmm. influence is very strong, has been and still continues to be strong. So probably some of the future speakers will touch on that issue. Thanks. But Irfan, can you please comment on that? Yes, thank you so much for all these uh, great comments, uh, Jesab and uh, Roshni ma'am. Uh, as, as I was saying, these historical perspectives are so important uh, and uh, uh, like we have to keep on talking history, in my opinion, if we really want to go ahead and uh, do the uh, decolonization attempts, but I very considerably take your comments and we will look forward to 
I hope my uh, further speakers here would be touching some of the points. And my main motive of joining this forum is to learn from all of you, all of your valuable comments and the widely experienced speakers who are going to speak after me. So I am still a learner and student of all this decolonization, everything. But thank you for all the wise comments that you have been making. And this really uh, uh, improves our passion to continue studying about decolonization and its uh, global coordination. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you very much. I just want to draw your attention to Shani's um, comment in the chat, which is, I think it is vital to start with a historical perspective. So hearing about the roots was actually the perfect framework. So kudos to you there. And of course, Dr. Bhatti Govindan, it's good to mention Gandhi here as he led decolonization as well as decolonial the colony, coloniality and Tagore as well. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, I want to move on now and thank you again, Irfan. So let's hear from our second speaker. And this is Mr. Sanyo Hira Baburam of the Netherlands, originally from Suriname. He is the secretary of the Decolonial International Network Foundation and co-editor of the book series entitled Decolonizing the Mind. His pen name is Jay Baburam. Welcome, sir. You can go ahead. Thank you, uh, Shilima. Thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to this platform. Um, looking forward to the uh, discussion. Um, let me start by sharing um, uh, the PowerPoint which I have uh, prepared. Um, so uh, I uh, just finished a book after 12 years of work called uh, titled Decolonizing the Mind, uh, a guide to decolonial theory and practice. It was published in January, 600 pages, and that deals with uh, decolonial theory and practice. And today, I'm giving a short sketch of, of it in a few minutes and then okay, apply Baburam. it to the Indian mind. Mr. Baburam, would you mind speaking up a little bit, please? Oh, is it the, okay, let me. Uh, Thank you. Okay, now, uh, uh, decolonial uh, uh, theory um, deals, in my view, with uh, analyzing uh, the rise of a new world civilization. Uh, colonial world civilization uh, since 1492. And I define the civilization as the collection of societies with a specific cultural base, a knowledge base, ethics views on how to organize a structure or society. Uh, and colonialism is that global system, the collection of economic, political, social, and cultural institutions that the global North has created in order to rule the world in a colonial world civilization. Now, um, what is uh, uh, colonizing the mind? In order to understand decolonizing the mind, we need to understand colonizing of the mind. Uh, and uh, the colonizing of the mind, the other term is, is mental slavery. And if you uh, look at mental slavery, what it is, uh, I'll give you an example with uh, the world map. Mental slavery is a distortion of reality. Here on the left, you have the map that is used in many schools, educational system, and the Mercato map, uh, which put Europe at the center of the world and distorts the real uh, 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 proportions of, of the world. Africa is 40 times larger than Greenland, but on the map, it appears that it has the same size. South Abyayala, Abyayala is a term that is used for the America, South America. Is twice the size of Europe, but on the map, Europe appears larger than South Abyayala. Alaska appears three times the size of Mexico, while Mexico is larger at 1.5 square kilometers. And Germany appears in the center uh, of, of the map, but that's arbitrary because the Chinese have a world map where they put China uh, in the center. The Gulf Peoples map here on the right gives you another view of the world to get the correct proportions. But there's no need to put the north on the top and the south on the bottom. You could do it like this. And when you look at the map here, you get totally disoriented because this is still the reality of the world, but your mind has not been accustomed to look at it in this way. So what is 
decolonizing the mind. This first is decolonizing knowledge production. And there are other things coming after it, which is attitudes and, and, and mentality, etc. But decolonizing knowledge production has three dimensions. One is a critique of Eurocentric knowledge production. It's not just a general critique. It's a critique on the level of distinctive disciplines. It analyzes the ways in which knowledge has been colonized. In the book, I do this for uh, world history, for philosophy, for economic, social, political, cultural theory, for mathematics and the natural sciences. Um, so we look at how in the different disciplines the knowledge has been colonized. Uh, it evaluates the concepts of other civilizations in these disciplines, because other civilizations, including the Indian civilizations, had already produced ideas of how to structure a society, uh, for, uh, an economic, social, political, cultural institution, how to organize uh, 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 knowledge production. So we look at how other civilizations have dealt with it without the rages, uh, racist prejudice of superiority and inferiority what has, that was embedded in the notion of modernity and rationalism, because if if rationalism uh, uh, arose in 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 Europe, how did people outside of Europe think? If they are not thinking with their mind, with their ratio, what were they thinking with? With their ass? Um, so uh, behind rationalism is this racist notion, uh, racist notion of superiority inferiority of Eurocentrism. And the third part of decolonizing knowledge is uh, to make a link to practical policy. What's the practical value of, of this for society? Now, uh, I define knowledge as insight and understanding about the natural and social world as expressed in concept that describes and explains certain aspects of the social and natural world. And a concept, the core of, of knowledge, consists of three elements, terminology, observation, what kind of facts uh, an observation do you bring into your narrative? The analysis, uh, uh, not only what, what is going on, but why. Uh, the theory, how is the concept related to bigger theories and ethics? I won't go into these things. I will just do it in the application uh, to, uh, of DTM, decolonizing the mind to the Indian diaspora. And I focus on five elements, the critique of the historiography of indentured labor, decolonizing the archives, how to bring the Indian civilization into the discourse of a new universal world civilization, a DTM view on race relations and decolonizing public memory of indentured labor. <clears throat> now, a critique of, of uh, the historiography uh, of indentured labor. Um, uh, in, in indentured labor study, there's a school that portrays British uh, colonialism as a normal uh, uh, phenomena. It's called British India. It's not called occupied India. When the, the German occupied France is not called German France. It's called occupied France. You see, the terminology uh, gives you an idea. And then the analysis, uh, indentured labor, why did it came into existence? It's linked to famine in general, not to the British colonial policy that engineered this famine, which uh, uh, Mike Davis explained in his book, The Late His, uh, Victorian Holocaust. And there is a silence in those studies about the British robbery of India. Uh, and, and here uh, you can see, uh, uh, you know, um, how uh, uh, Indian economists uh, calculated that the British took 50, 50, uh, uh, $45 trillion out of India. That explains the background of indentured labor. Should. So the historiography should take those things into account rather than uh, think that indentured labor is just kind of natural process which you have to accept as, as a, a normal thing. Then uh, the next thing is uh, the truth about oppression, exploitation, and resistance, uh, uh, is, which is there in the archival records, you could see it, is deleted in the historiography of indentured labor uh, for a long time. It's now recently that there is a trend where there's uh, attention for it. Uh, take, for example, the bare facts. The average age of people came in, coming from India to Suriname was 20 years, and they were checked as healthy persons at departure. Yet 60% of them didn't survive indentorship. 
uh, 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 they died of hunger, diseases, extortion. There were 40 cases, here's the list of cases of revulsive plantations to ending executions of about 30 people. This was not part of the mainstream narrative of Indian uh, indentured labor historiography. Now it's, it's beginning to change. And one of the persons who, who delve into the archives is Dr. Rajinder Bhagwan Bali, who really, uh, uh, he published since 1969, um, uh, all these books which, uh, uh, which painted this picture of oppression, exploitation, and, and reform. Now, the second element is um, how to decolonize the archives, uh, because archives are important in constituting uh, Indian identity and, and identity of people uh, in the diaspora. And now often it is centered around the needs of the archives to publish their records. Uh, but taking from the perspective of the users, uh, we need to bring all this data in a central portal, uh, uh, atone to the need of finding family in India and connecting to other families in the Indian diaspora. And uh, uh, in, in, in Suriname, the National Foundation of Indian Immigration in Suriname and in Holland Tsunami Highs have made an effort to do that. And here you see the website, this is, this is still some books in it, but um, where uh, they bring together all these databases, uh, uh, the immigration database that Maurice Hassan Khan and I built uh, in uh, 20 years ago and, and uh, new databases, the South African database, the, the current ge geography of India linked to the historical geography. So on Google Maps, you can find uh, uh, some of these things. Um, so, uh, the, the, so decolonizing the archives takes as a center point uh, the, the need of the, the user. And then the third point I want to mention is uh, in D DTM, decolonizing uh, the mind theory, uh, uh, the perspective is that we should go beyond the colonial world civilization and build a new world civilization. And building a new world civilization, which means that we build a pluriversal world world civilization, which knowledge base that acknowledges the validity of knowledge in the different civilizations in the global south. Uh, and the Indian diaspora can work together with thinkers of, of India uh, to, to reconstruct the discipline. Here is uh, chapter seven on the book on decolonizing mathematics and natural science. I, I, I work closely with uh, uh, Professor C.K. Raju in India about this idea of decolonizing uh, the hard sciences. And then the, the, the next thing is a DTM view on, on race relations. Uh, uh, I, I develop a clear theory of, of the history of racism and, and how to understand racism as part of the colonial world civilization, this chapter six of the book, and, and articulate a vision for the future because uh, decolonial theory should be practical. It should tell you what's the next step. And especially in uh, Guyana, uh, Trinidad and Suriname, the Afro-Indian relationship is something that we need to look at carefully uh, to articulate a vision for the future based on peace, prosperity, solidarity against hate, uh, you know, uh, uh, shared poverty and competition. There are things that develop out of DTM theory. And then the last thing uh, which I'll deal with is uh, how to deal with public memory. Uh, you see in, in uh, uh, Suriname, I guess also in other countries, you have this concept of celebrating Indian Arrival Day. Other, uh, uh, other groups uh, like the Afros, they don't celebrate the beginning of oppression of, and exploitation. They celebrate the end of it. And, and uh, seeing indentorship as a system of oppression and exploitation would, would uh, mean that you should acknowledge it like this, and rather than celebrating, uh, you should, you know, uh, uh, celebrate the resistance which was there against Indian colonial uh, against the colonialism. This is also in this phrase that is used uh, in the Indian community. I'm glad that the colonizer took me away from India, if because if they didn't, I would be suffering uh, poverty in India, which is first a demeaning way of looking at India and the struggle against colonialism and oppression and exploitation. And it's also a, a self-degradation that you don't think that you could have uh, uh, been 
a, a great person in India, that could have been Mahatma Gandhi in India. And you see in public memory, the old queue is centered around this uh, thing of 3D. Uh, doxa Daru Dansi, Doxa Eskori Duck. Uh, Daru is whiskey, alcohol, and Dansi is peace and, 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 and dance. A new way of uh, public memory is uh, where, you, uh, where you commemorate the suffering. You start with one minute of silence of those who have been executed. This, this video you see is played uh, in uh, certain uh, commemoration events where they put the list of the people who have been executed. Uh, uh, commemorating the sufferings in the history, in telling and singing in the plays, uh, the celebration of resistance, bringing down the statue of the colonizer and replacing it by statue of freedom fighters. And uh, you commemorate it in celebrating in public space, uh, the question of, um, of commemoration. Now, uh, let me go somewhat deeper. One of the figures uh, which was probably discovered by uh, Dr. Bhagwan Bali was the figure of Johnny Kitri, who came to Suriname in 1880 with a one year old daughter, worked at Plantation South and Hope, and led the uprising in 1884, was executed with a shot fired from behind. And the order was given by Agent General Barnett Leon, who has a statue near the presidential palace. So the, the youth people here in, uh, uh, in, in, in Holland, Bhagwan Bali, discovered the story. Uh, there was a two-episode drama documentary, uh, Televised, in 2013. In Holland, there are streets named after her in Amsterdam and, and Rotterdam. And uh, the annual commemoration of Indian indentorship uh, uh, she is honored in songs and plays. The second is how here you could see a march of memory. The uh, text is the uh, commemoration of Indian immigration, where young women uh, take the names of those who have been executed uh, and, and have a public march in commemorating uh, the, uh, the, the thing there. The, suffering there. And I uh, here is the colonial statue of uh, Barnett Leon on the left, uh, near the presidential palace, and a campaign uh, 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 was organized to bring it down and replace it by the statue of Tetri, uh, which was finally uh, uh, realized. And I will end with a music clip in three languages about Tetri that gives you an idea how the youth now deals with a public memory of indentorship, uh, and it, uh, it's a song in three uh, languages. And I'll stop there, but let's look, uh, listen to it.
Thank you. A very, very insightful presentation, Sid. Thank you so much. There are a few comments in the chat and um, I really want to ask, again, I'm opening the floor to our audience. If you have burning questions, this is the time to please raise your electronic hand and you can go ahead and pose your question directly to our speaker, Mr. Stanley Hero. Um, but Dr. Betty Govindan uh, says in the chat, we must aim at collective memorialization with a sense of our shared histories, especially our histories of diverse struggles. And I want to say that that clip um, in Dutch, English, and what is it, Hindi? Yeah, Bhojpuri, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of captures that and brings it into the contemporary space as well. So um, perhaps it's an excellent way of memorializing uh, the event, as well as the individuals concerned. I'm not seeing any raised hands and I'm quite surprised. Uh, there was another comment which was raised earlier. Okay, while I look for that, let me bring Shani. Shani, please unmute. Yes, thank you so much for your presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. I do have perhaps something we could carry forward as a conversation it, and it comes back down to Indian Arrival Day. Um, in the case of Jamaica, the last ship, you know, there was there was nothing that said, okay, this is the end of indentureship. Um, at the end of slavery, yes, there was a proclamation. And so we, most of the Caribbean islands, we have um, a day where we celebrate emancipation. So perhaps, in having Indian arrival day, we're beginning with that point where the Indians first came to our shores. Um, I, I, I'm not being nitpicking, but you know, what other day would we possibly celebrate if we didn't have an actual ending to indentureship within our islands? Um, we look at it yes as a day when our ancestors came to our shores. I don't think we look at it as the day when we were rescued, particularly from India, because that was not the case for many, many Indians. Some were taken away, forcibly kidnapped, etc. So I think it's just a point for us saying, okay, this is when our first ancestors came to our shores, but let's have a conversation. Somebody else can join in. Yeah, well said, Shani. Um, Mr. Hero, would you like to reply yeah. to that? Yes, uh, in fact, um, there is an end date uh, on the individual level. It was the end of the five-year contract and that ended of the same day that it started. So uh, the, the uh, 5th of June in Suriname is the day of the arrival of the first ship. Uh, basically the 5th of June. Five years later was the end of, on the individual level, and obviously in 1916 uh, the last ship uh, came, and you could you could take that as a, a date. But the the dates, uh, the discussion on the dates symbolizes the discussion of what do you celebrate and what do you commemorate. So uh, uh, if you celebrate resistance, then there's a reason for celebration, but uh, that goes hand in hand with commemorating the suffering and those who have died. You know, the, the people, 16% have died uh, while they were in their 20s. Uh, and, and, and we had this 40 uprising. So the commemoration is about, and you can use the same date of the 5th of June uh, when they arrived uh, to commemorate the suffering that they went into and celebrate the resistance there. But then you need to have a historiography that gives you the facts of resistance, of suffering, while the historiography uh, before, you know, the rise of this critical historical school was very much based on thanking the colonizer for bringing uh, uh, people out of abject poverty and famine to, to Suriname. So you need a different narrative for that. Great, thank you so much. I wanna ask uh, Dr. Derek Davy to go ahead, please. Okay, can you hear me? Thanks. Yes, go Thanks. ahead. However, welcome everybody. Derek from 
all the way from Winnipeg, Canada. And special hello to Brother Ravi Dev from Guyana, fellow Guyanese. I thank, I have to thank immensely the contribution from Dr. Well, new, new graduate Ifran Prelani and Andrew, Andrew Hira. You have identified, both of you, clearly the legacy and the richness of our culture. However, we also outline our challenges. And as um, Ifran Prelani mentioned, Swami Vivananda talked about let's conquer the world with goodwill and education share the wisdom of the Indus civilization. Andrew Hera talked about the, the history and the challenges we had, but then in the video I noticed, that's why I'm calling in, there's a leader in, I hope I read the video well, a woman leader, action, knowledge, history, action, all around the world right now, or the diaspora, and especially India and Guyana, Trinidad, we have challenges. But the independence has happened over 50, 75 years now in India, we know what the British done, but we now have to take charge. And leadership from the political, political to the volunteer level, I think we must grasp our communities from, I list here, from sports, culture, in the environment, anti-racism, health, education, every school, I'm a school official, we are teaching our culture, we are teaching leadership. And I just like any comment or please, if you agree, great. But every organization you see that is successful, they, there's an outcome. And any society I see that is not running well, there's no leadership there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, let's hear from you, Mr. Hira. Yes, uh, I, I agree. Uh, uh, but in my view, it starts with a, a clear theoretical view of how you look at, at history, you know, if you have this colonial view of history, obviously there's no practical translation other than thanking, uh, thanking the colonizers. There of Columbus who started the genocides of the indigenous people in uh, Abiyala, there are 650 statues, you know, is celebrating basically uh, uh, the achievements of uh, a mass murder, but uh, not not. Uh, portraying him as a mass murderer, but as an inventor uh, and a discoverer. So it starts with uh, another view on history, and then it translates into education, into books, and into popular culture with things you see now with the commemoration march, with uh, history books, with uh, 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 events, uh, uh, etc. Uh, so the, the the close connection of theory and practice is needed here. Mm -hmm. Okay, Irfan, would you like to respond? Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a very clear comment that uh, we have to start back from the primary education. And as Hira sir mentioned, it should be uh, not only awareness, it should also be practice. So I would like to reiterate that, Andrew. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Jay, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Just Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at uh, uh, Sandu Hira's book should be the guidebook to what the Indian diaspora should read and uh, the, the organizations that's involved with the diaspora. And you find there's so many organizations. Now, the to get to the organizations and try to educate them is going to be a task. That is why the future generations in the school system is what I, I can see, because you can't re-educate us because we did the history, we understand the history, and we know what the, the, the establishment gave, what the Br British or the Dutch or the German or the French, they taught and they gave their part of it but it's from our side, which we are not educating from our perspective. And that is the key. And as Hira has put together a, a, a good synopsis of how what we should celebrate and what we shouldn't, not that we have to cut off the com complete celebration. We celebrate coming to a land 
but we also will have to remember when we were uh, emancipated. And if you look at every person's uh, birth certificate, the old birth certificate in South Africa, the moment you are free after you did your five-year tenure or 10-year tenure, you become a free person, then you move anywhere. With the slaves, they were freed when they were uh, removed from their shackles and the emancipation came about. So all the celebration and commemoration go hand in hand. And the very fact that the stories that we hear that people came out of India because of poverty, well, as Hira says, it was created poverty. It wasn't the poverty of uh, natural poverty. It was an artificial, which was purposely done for economic reasons and political power. And when the time they removed people from India, they brought them into the colonies and subjugated them, uh, controlled them, and wanted to uh, use them as chattels so that they can profit. So it wasn't people, it was profit before people. So that's where I say uh, good presentation, very well done. And, you know, it gives me more to read now. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> um, yeah, th thank you, Jay. Um, I, I want to take up a point you made, which is education and the role of, uh, I would say, universities in knowledge production. Um, I, uh, last month, I did a, a book tour in South Africa and Zambia, visiting nine universities. And what I saw is the, the structures of the universities are not, are not geared toward decolonization uh, and, and are geared toward em emulating uh, the big universities, Oxford and, 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 and uh, Harvard, et cetera, uh, not seeing that these are colonized institutions and that the movement for decolonizing knowledge production, uh, like in, in Cape Town, University of Cape Town, came from, from below you know, from, from students and activists. And I think, um, uh, uh, I, I think that kind of movement from below to decolonize knowledge and the disciplines goes hand in hand with the question, what comes next? What does decolonizing economic theory means for economic policy? What does uh, decolonizing political theory means for political institutions and political uh, organizations? And, and I think um, uh, there is a lot of work to be done uh, from below to pressure the university administration to take decolonizing the curriculum seriously. Yes, I would want to agree with you there. Thank you very much for that comment. I want to bring um, 1860. Do we have Mr. Naidu with us? Please go ahead and unmute. Uh, good evening, everyone. Well, it's good evening from South Africa's point of view, but uh, yeah, excellent presentation. I'm very thrilled about some of your points of view. Um, you know, the 50 years of scholarships that we've that we've had centers around agency and Tinker's view of New Age slavery. I just want to ask the question: Is in contemporary studies is there an overbalance on agency versus you know what you had mentioned with regard to the high debt? debt rate with regard to exhaustion on the plantations, the, the 5,500 of the 34,016% that you mentioned that died of hunger and uh, exhaustion and so on. I just feel that there must be a balance between agency and the, the new age slavery thoughts of Tinker in that I think um, imperial apology and erasure is precisely why we've had the Black Lives matter movement in two decades into the 21st century. And I think specifically with indenture studies, this imperial apology and erasure is precisely where we are. And I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. But just your thoughts on that, and if there's an overbalance on agency versus thinkers, think, uh, huge thinkers' thoughts. Right. So the, the thing is, thank you for your comments. Uh, um, that I don't, uh, um, I don't see now. You know, Thinker obviously, you know, uh, pointed out the uh, similarities with slavery. Mr. Hira, uh, right? Can I ask you to just speak up a little louder, please? All right. So Thank yes, you. I'm. I was saying that um, 
think, uh, you know, um, uh, compared indentured labels to, to slavery, a new system of slavery, which, which is good in terms of pointing out uh, uh, the economic, political structures, the way people were treated, that's fine. But uh, to, to go into the heart of matter is putting the legitimacy of British colonialism on the agenda is first and foremost what, what needs to be done. Uh, and not just the, the system of excesses. Uh, and the second thing is, um, uh, I, I, I don't work with these terms of agency. I, when I talk about revolt and, uh, and, and, and um, uh, fighting against oppression, uh, I, I, I don't think that term agency covers that. The, the term liberation is what, what I use. Uh, There's a liberation struggle and agency is more of an administrative term, but liberation struggle and the need to fight for liberation is basically what is at hand uh, there. Um, and and uh, what needs to, to be done uh, in, in historiography is going back to the archives and then going back to the archives with the decolonial uh, glaze, uh, gaze, because then you will see things. Why have other historians not dig up the story of Johnny Chetri and the uh, figure of 5,500 uh, uh, people who, uh, who died because these are figures from the archives. So it tells you that we need to decolonize uh, the way history teaching is at the universities. Okay, excellent, thank you very much, Foyo, for your responses and um, to all of you who would have asked questions. Mr. Hira, excellent thank presentation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to move on now to our third and final speaker today. And this is no stranger to us, Mr. Ravi Dev of Guyana, a former New York corporate executive and attorney, as well as a former member of parliament and Indian civil rights activist in Guyana. He's now a newspaper columnist and media consultant. Welcome, sir. The floor is yours. Please unmute. Namaskar, assalamu alaikum, peace, grace, and hope. Uh, uh, let me first thank you, the organizers of this extremely critical uh, topic um, at our juncture. I do believe uh, the world itself is at an inflection point in terms of this whole notion of colonialism uh, with the rise of the powers from the East, China and India, even South Africa, uh, and there are other countries that are looking for uh, membership in, for example, a new bloc, the BRICS bloc, even Egypt and other countries. So I do think we are at a critical point where uh, this kind of discussion um, will be, uh, I guess, a trigger for much more effective action within the new dispensation that is emerging. Well, we're talking about decolonizing the Indian mind. And I want to focus a bit more on the decolonizing aspect, which our two for our former speakers uh, explicitly said, uh, you know, they wouldn't. They spent more time on the, the, the whys. But they do go together. So I, let me not say that I'm going to throw out the, the one. I'd like to begin by quoting a scholar of internship, a legal scholar, my background. Uh, I am not a, a scholar, let me not say that. I, I am an activist. And I have returned to Guyana uh, for 35 years now and has been on the ground to deal concretely with this question of decolonizing the Indian mind, because that's a community that when I returned to Guyana, I worked within. I'm still here. I'm still, for example, living in the home. Uh, where my four parents came out from the sugar plantation and live and, and got a, a, a plot of land uh, in the shadows, literal shadows mm -hmm. of the sugar plantation. That sugar plantation, Iflat sugar plantation, is the last one in the colony uh, of Demerara. And as such, we still see the, the structures of coloniality are remaining very strong at a very, very uh, ground level. It is not theory when I talk about colonialism and the need for decolonizing uh, the Indian mind because the sugar workers uh, in Guyana 
are almost uh, 80% to 90% of Indian descent. So when one talks of decolonizing uh, the, the Indian mind, it is still a matter of the Indian mind for Guyana writ large. I begin by quoting this legal scholar uh, who talked about that, that this whole notion of colonialism was when the other, when Europe encountered the other, this notion of alterity, when it encountered this other, they were engulfed in operations of modernity. Again, they were engulfed. Another one said we were uh, almost shanghai We were conscripted by modernity. There was not much we could do about it. And that modernity assumes a single trajectory of human history, which we are still living out by and large. And if we are to decolonize our mind, we will have to question that trajectory, which almost every country is still uh, traveling on. He said, not only were we um, engulfed by the operations of modernity, but we were then located in zones of exclusion or exception. So we modernity then chose from its own perspective to exclude us in whichever way it thought it wanted to. So we are the other. So we were othered, we were defined out in some cases like with slavery, out of humanity. And you, you had what was created, for example, what was called a great chain of being with a white gray-haired God on top, his white angels and humanity, the white uh, man was there. And at the other extreme was the African, the black African, and placed in intermediate positions were uh, the other quote unquote races that were created, literally, literally created. And of course, one aspect of colonial, colonialism that still exists, those of us who may not be African, we are fighting for a position in that hierarchy. So I am not darker than this one. I am fairer, my hair is a bit straighter. And if we think about it, it is beyond irony. It is beyond irony, but it is still there. And of course, and the, and the, the writer went on to say that after being located in zones of exception, we were then positioned in states of subordination because the colonial state in every case just didn't make us an exception. It was it was a it was in a located in a state of subordination, invariably and inevitably, we were made to feel inferior. Right, in my own neck of the woods in Latin America, even though Guyana uh, is part of the Caribbean, we are also part of Latin America. We are on the South American coast. The Latin American theorist, sociological theorist Anibal Aquino. He, say, he talks about colonialism and makes a distinction between colonialism, which was a historical event, which supposedly ended uh, after World War II, when the colonies were quote unquote, uh, given independence. But the structures now still remain as coloniality. And this is what we then, have to be concerned about. And he, he said, these structures, these deep structures that are there, present, but we don't see them because they are beneath the surface, are systems of racial hierarchies. He's echoing the other, the other right I'm quoted. So they are systems of racial hierarchies. No matter how you cut it, slice it, or dice it, we talked about capitalism, we talked about a world system, and you may look at it from an economic standpoint, social standpoint, uh, philosophical standpoint, what have you? The modern world modernity implies racial hierarchies. 
in every thought, whether it is in literature and you read Othello, you know about grace. When you read um, uh, even a book on mathematics, it's about race. Professor Hira talks about what is excluded, whose theories as to who came up first with a theory of the world being a globe. It is still, uh, it is race that is imbricated in all these forms of knowledge. And secondly, he says, we still have the colonial systems of knowledge. Colonialism was as much an uh, expedition of epistemology as of uh, any other thing. It all comes down to knowledge, where they defined what is knowledge. They defined what is knowledge and discarded, and their knowledge, of course, all came from them, even if it meant rewriting history. So when the British talks about the Greek city-state that led to democracy that they were going to tutor, tutor us into, you would think from reading their history that there was a direct connection between um, uh, Sparta and Athens and England. Never mind that there was 2,000 years gap when England were living in, English people were living in caves. You would never suspect uh, that. So it comes back now to the whole system of knowledge that we should now question how much if this is of this knowledge that we pass on to our young ones are still of that bent. Lastly, Aquino talks about the, the cultural systems, the whole Eurocentric notion that Europe knows better. So we can't make a distinction about America. America comes out of that same Eurocentric bias. America, in fact, took over that mantle after World War II, when a weakened in England had to pass on the baton became and become a junior partner. So America is simply continuing that tradition of a racialized hierarchy, an epistemological hierarchy, and a cultural system, a, a system of cultural hierarchies that exist in the world. All of these must be looked at. So I will not spend much time, Professor Hira has done some, um, my brother Irfan has done some, uh, in terms of what happened to India. But we must not forget, for example, when we talk about Mahatma Gandhi, why was Gandhi made into this icon? The English specifically constructed a view from the Macaulay minutes that the, the typical Indian was a weak, effete, effeminate, vaporous creature, the Bengali Babu. And therefore the martial uh, race were others that they would have co-opted later in their conquest, uh, the Sikhs and the Patans and, and what have you. But the, the typical Indian that the British constructed was that weak, effete Indian. And so therefore we were what is called a spiritual people. And we took this as a compliment and you will have Indians, including Mahatma Gandhi, who would boast about this, that we are a spiritual people. But what did that spirituality do for us in terms of the British conquest? We see the Americans doing the same thing when I was a boy with Martin Luther King versus Malcolm X. When Malcolm said, burn baby, burn, and they were burning the cities uh, of the inner, the inner ghettos in America, the Americans of course built up Martin Luther King because he was a follower of Gandhi. And he would say, you know, slap me on this cheek then slap me on that cheek. What did it do for those people? So in 2023, we still need a Black Lives Matter. We still need to say Black Lives Matter. What did all that cheek tapping do for, uh, for African people? And we will ask the same for people of Indian descent, wherever we were scattered like chawar across uh, the globe by the British. You know, we have to ask where did that cheek tapping? And that is one of the problems 
So we accept that we are not a martial race and therefore we just take it. So in every colony that we were sent, whether in Fiji, whether in Guyana, whether in Suriname, whether in Trinidad, we thought it was okay when the British excluded us from the army and the police force. They excluded us. Well, that's the kind of people we are. We don't want to become uh, that. Somehow we are not a martial race coming out of the India, of the British uh, hegemony uh, that, that they constructed. And we are still imprisoned by that today. So if you come to Guyana, we, we, when I came back, we, we invoked something called the Indian ethnic security dilemma. But in a democracy, which again, we were foisted on us as the way to choose our leadership. If the Indian took power because of his numbers like Chadi Jagan did, he could always be overthrown because there was no one in the army, in the bureaucracy, in the police. Same in Fiji, same in, in, in Suriname, same in, in, in Trinidad. So we have in decolonizing the Indian mind, we have to be very specific as to what needs to be decolonized. And for example, Mahatma Gandhi, he initially spoke about nonviolence as a tactical measure that if, and this was the big if, if the Indians, and that was his assumption, his premise, if the Indians of India were in a position to make an effective attack on the British frontally, then he would accept violence. Gandhi was never initially, but then he transmuted that into a whole philosophy where nonviolence became in and of itself something to be extolled. Nonviolence or violence, these are like tactical uh, decisions that have to be made in the positions you are uh, have. So when, for example, when I returned to Guyana in 1998, when Indians were beaten like dogs in the streets of Georgetown, all because they simply voted for a party of their choice that happened to be Indian. And they were beaten in full view of the police and the army. Should we not have spoken up? Well, the Indian leadership did not speak up. And that's when we launched a political movement to say, no, we have to um, uh, have our rights protected. V.S. Naipaul, our great Nobel Prize winning um, novelist, and one of the greatest on, uh, how do I put it, remark uh, writer, always spoke about the unprotectedness of the Indian in the diaspora for that very reason, because he saw what could happen. Just two years ago, we saw uh, people in the streets of Durban being brutalized, being killed, Individuals had to resort to vigilantes to guard their street. Where was the police? Where was the army? Why wasn't that army put out? You have individuals in South Africa today, Malema, who could talk about expelling the Indians in the sea. And we must now talk about turning various cheeks and maybe not these cheeks, maybe the cheeks below also. You know, that is what is a scum. So I want to bring the point, what we did in Guyana, of obviously we must have a theory of colonization to decolonize. And one of the theories we picked was Gramsci's notion of hegemony. When he was looking to explain why were the poor of 1920s Italy joining the fascists when that, that was not in their objective, he calls it objective uh, interest. So Gramsci, of course, came up with this notion of hegemony, where a certain class or a group of people within a society, they seize the moral and philosophical leadership. And therefore, the rest of the people become convinced that that is just the way things are. And we accept it, we go along. So we see our situation as a plight, something endemic in the society and not as a problem that we can resolve. And that is what we have to do. And what we have done in Guyana in the last 30 years to identify these, these um, specific nodes that have to be decolonized. The school, of course, and the universities are 
paramount because this is where the British constructed new knowledge from the Macaulay Minute by forming those three schools in Calcutta, in Madras, and in Mumbai, Bombay, they called it then. And, they, and, and all our elite had to become educated voluntarily. We rushed for it because a distinction was now made. Only if you pass through these schools, you were quote unquote educated. The people who for 5,000 years had constructed one of the most prosperous civilizations on planet Earth that had 20% of the global GNP uh, as when England encountered it weren't educated. No, no, we had to be educated. So, for example, in Guyana, we had to now throw on the, on the agenda that it was these quote unquote uneducated peasants that they derided from the Bhojpuri belt, like my great grandfather Ram Bishun, who came in, in, 19, in 1888, who started a rice in industry. When the British and the Americans had failed, it was because they understood technology of rice of how the mares were supposed to be formed, when water was to be let in, when water was to be let out, when the sea, when the soil was acidic or alkaline. I remember my Aja picking up a piece of dirt and putting it on his tongue. He did not need no chemist to tell him that, but yet that was not knowledge. So today in Guyana sugar, Guyana cannot even produce 70,000 tons of sugar. But we are now producing on the backs of those peasants 600,000 tons of rice in a, in a world where food security is paramount. And we are heading towards a million by those same quote unquote unknowledgeable individuals. So yes, we have to fix the schools, but sadly those who are running the affairs of our countries, they have not uh, decolonize their own minds. And we had to intercede just again two years ago with this new so-called Indian government. They were introducing new books for primary school students that went back to a century ago when the British were sending something called Royal Readers. So when we would read about the black hole of Calcutta and weep about how those poor English uh, were being killed by Suraj Daulat, you know? And yet we did not, we do not weep for all that was massacred in 12 instances when people, when Indians were shot, when they fought for their own uh, uh, labor rights, that was in a contract, in a contract. And we, so I want to just come back to this point. We can go on and on and talk about this. So we can pick all of the, the, the areas where you're he hegemonized. And today we can blame the Americans, but nothing has changed. They are simply disseminating the information. And we have all these smart devices into which it is beamed. And our children, my children, your children are now beaming into uh, getting, whether it's his music, we, don't, we call it Kuligana and it is uh, derided. You know, we used to have, my Nana used to talk about five bars of, 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 um, of, of culture, right? Your bhesh, your clothes, right? Your bhojan, your food, your bhajan, your songs, your uh, uh, bhajan, your, 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 your music. And I forget the other two at this minute, but the point is we have thrown all of those out because that is not knowledge. We want all this fancy postmodern literature and all this fancy language, you know. So we have thrown out those, uh, those, those kind of things. For example, we have these beauty pageants, all of course run on Western aesthetics as to what is beauty. And it is rather ironic, but not surprising, that India is a country with the largest uh, market for whitening creams, you know. Where did that come from? It's that racial hierarchy. So yet we have, yes, we have Shah Rukh, uh, um, you know, taking, taking ads for whitening cream and we, uh, we think nothing about it. But to come back to Guyana, what we have been doing at the grassroots, and this is where it has to begin because this is where it'll end. Because in the Caribbean, 
we after independence suffered another another strata of colonization when the independence leaders like eric williams dr eric williams out of all saints college uh, oxford and forbes burnham out of the university of london guyana scholar when they came back they assumed that they would continue the creole hegemony over the indian coolie and so creole culture was valorized by williams and and, and burnham and so also in in um suriname after a bit of a a, a more even strain by the 70s, they went the same route, where Creole culture is now the definition of the national culture. So we have now been relegated out of the picture as ethnic groups. So our struggle in Guyana is a daily one. And so therefore we, we work with youths, with young people, with the same derided um, uh, Kuli art forms. And even India has its own presumptions of what is culture. Have you checked these, these so-called the, the Indian cultural, whatever, the ICCR, uh, the, the product that they sent? Most of us are from the Bhojpuri belt. Most of us are from the Bhojpuri belt. Why is it that kind of folk song? Why is it that the Chautal? Why is it that the Nagara? Why is it that all of we are not taught by the, the Indian Cultural Center? Why is it only Kuchipudi and Bharanatyam? Nothing wrong with Bharatanatyam. Huh? Why is my food, dal bhat, my favorite food of all time is dal and rice, dal bhat and bhaji? Huh? So when I sane that, right? So I always marvel at these um, Indian beauty queens. They face, they, you know, they have the ca Caucasian feature. So they win beauty contests now. But ask them uh, some questions called, what is your favorite food? I am yet to find a single one of them that says, I like dal and rice and bhaji. And we like to sane it. And we like to chat in my hand. Because it's sweeter. It's all part of the hegemony. Um, uh, Shalim, you got to tell me when my time is up. I've lost track. Am I? Am I? My time up? I, I, I'm just letting you go. Okay. <laughs> I'm just letting you go. <laughs> okay. So coming back to it, um, we come back to even at the university level, uh, we have to stop this nonsense with looking down on African uh, Guyanese or African Surinamese and African Trinidadians. We are all part of that same hegemonizing project, and we must empathize with people of African descent for what they have had to go on to us to be the antithesis of all that was black. And imagine the irony of literally to be black is all that white is not. Huh? Talk about othering. Can you ever imagine a more potent othering other than that? So we must stop that nonsense. And that's what we're doing in Guyana. We have made common cause with some African leaders who are culturally oriented. And because the University of Guyana um, while it has aspects of, in, of, of African history, it does not have these things that we are talking about, about co coloniality and all that. So it is not only doing a disservice to Indians by having African history, but the African history is a distorted one, which must be rectified to let Africans understand uh, how all of this is coming down on them and why it is. So if, for example, in Guyana, it is a common thing, say, coolie racist against blacks. Well, if it was an Indian invention of racism, so how come in the Ukraine war, the blacks couldn't even go on the trains to get out of the Ukraine? Why is it in South uh, Korea, who never saw an African during colonialism? They are anti-African or China or Japan. It is embedded as an aspect of modernity in the books, in the pictures, in everything. So to be, to be in this modern world, you got to be a racist. The bot that's the bottom line. And that's why I, I will never forget, I'm in, 19, in 1973, I'm doing my, my first degree at Brooklyn College, and I go to a, to a cinema uh, in a mall. And there, one of these James Bond movies is showing, uh, not with um, the first one, um, what's his name again? It was the second one, uh, second James Bond. 
um, not Sean Connery, the, the second one. And James Bond is about to kiss the African Jamaican uh, actress or performer. Um, I've, again, her name, she was a big uh, woman, um, Grace Jones. And this black girl next to me cried out, no, James, no, no, James. You understand? No, meaning she couldn't conceive of the suave James Bond who likes it shaken and not stirred, kissing a black woman. And she was a black woman. And, and, and how far have we come? How far have we come? So to come back to it, we have to rectify our history. We have to rectify our literature in the schools. We have to straighten our police, army, judiciary, all of it. Uh, we have to stop this uh, cultural exclusion and the church, of course. I will end by taking issue, issue with our uh, most esteemed Professor Hero, uh, Hero on arrival day. I am one of the individuals when I returned to the Caribbean uh, and to Guyana specifically, was inspired by the efforts of some friends in Trinidad who agitated uh, in the 70s for Indian arrival day. And they had it um, uh, passed by 1995, I believe, or 96, somewhere around then. So in Guyana, I, we agitated for it. Uh, for Indian Arrival Day to be commemorated. And I was in parliament and I was a member of the committee that took evidence uh, and then passed uh, Indian Arrival Day. We, that's what we recommended. The government, so as not to uh, annoy others, chose to call it Arrival Day. But I'll tell Professor Hira our motivation. Arrival Day, listen to the word Arrival Day, because before then it was called Immigration Day. Immigration, you were talking of immigrating from India. The focus was on India. Arrival shifts the whole focus to the country into which we were now placed. And this was our homeland now. Two thirds of us and up remain here. And this became, so yes, we have arrived at this new home. Whatever the reasons, we can talk about the British destroying India, which they did causing those famines. But because even before we came as indentured, we were migrating all over India, especially from the Bhojpuri Belt, because uh, the whole notion of underdevelopment was deepest there because it was conquered the, the, the longest out of the Bengal presidency. So to come back to Guyana, we commemorate arrival day to declare that we are full citizens of this land called Guyana, Trinidad, and Suriname. That when our indentureship ended, as we said, each of us were free at that moment when my great Aja Ram Bishun from, uh, out from near Patna, Ishmaelpur near Patna, when he got his indentureship ended in 1893, he decided to remain here, got married and got um, uh, his son Ram Lagan, who is my grandfather who raised me. So this is not an academic thing. We have arrived and therefore the reality is that we are being today in these nations told we are not the real thing. So arrival emphasizes that yes, we are here and we have arrived. And lastly, we accept that they are, it is the arrival of us Indians and other indentured that made us into the plural society. But what we can offer out of our own culture, where in our culture it says, Eko hum pahusiam, that the divine said, I am one, but let there be many. That to be many is the fact of this universe. And therefore, our challenge is not to obliterate differences, but to deal constructively with the differences. And I end by quoting what is dharma. Dharma, it is quoted, that is our civilization, civilizational contribution to the world. Dharma is that which upholds and that which sustains. And therefore, those uh, cultural aspects that do those two things are dharmic, and we should be proud of our contribution to uh, up, uplifting and sustaining uh, the Caribbean in my case. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, as always. You dealt with the topic from an holistic perspective, 
And at this point in time, um, I don't even want to read all the comments that are in the chat because there are so many. I do, however, want those commentators to please raise your hand and give, voice your opinion because we do have a YouTube audience who cannot see our chat. And I would really appreciate it if you all can um, share your views with them. So um, please bring your comments and bring your questions by raising your electronic hand. I will, however, ask directly for um, Dr. Arnold Thomas from St. Vincent to please go ahead and mute his mic and comment. Can you hear me now? Clear. Well, oops, I think I lost the video. Anyway, absolutely fantastic. You know, I, <clears throat> I'm listening to this and I say, you know, we have so much to be thankful for, for, for our, uh, um, to, to our people. But part of our problem right now is that we don't, we never listen to our old people. Those who came from India, what they brought to them and how they struggled to make us who we are today. And this is part of the thing. And there's, uh, there, there, there's, um, there's a saying that's going wrong among a lot of descendants of, um, of um, of of um, <clears throat> Indians, that thank God we left India, because look at us, look look what's going on in India today. If we did not, if our people did not leave India, we would have been struggling to 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 this and this. But we were never told that it was the British, as was pointed out by Ravi and everybody else, that it was the British who destroyed Indian civilization and caused Indians to leave India. So what we need to do is to educate the young people to say, hey, listen, we are coming from a civilization that was far ahead of the Europeans. And now we have to take that into account and make sure that our young people understand that and be educated as to who we are, where we come from. Thank you very much. Excellent. Ravi Dev, would you like to reply? I couldn't agree more. And they, they, they say the proof of the pudding is in eating. And of course, that is a hegemonized statement. I, I, I should really actually say the, 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 the proof of the sawain is in the is in the eating, you know, because <laughs> we didn't taste a pudding till God knows when. So to come back to the point, yes, um, I look at my Aja, uh, my Aja who raised me from the age of six, I was sent to live with them because his last daughter, my aunt had married. And you, it was our custom, you send it, you know, this boy to help them in their chores. So I grew up with somebody who was born in 1896, whose father, as I said, had come from Ishmaelpur. And so he was speaking on a one-to-one -one basis. So he could tell me why his dad left India. There were seven sons and he, all of his children, he named them after his, his, his brothers, Ram Lagan, Ram Bishun, you know, Ram this and Ram that. So my Nano said, the seven brothers, because of the British imperial um, system of taxing the land, every year they had, I think, 16 bigas. Uh, I, think, I think the biga is more than an acre in that part of Bihar. And they had 16 bigas. So they had to pay their taxes to the landlord, uh, to, the, to the zamindar. And that the zamindar would have had to, of course, pass it upwards. So he, as the youngest brother, could not make a living. He knew that. So secondly, some of his neighbors had to shift from planting crops that would feed him to planting um, opium because the British wanted opium to, to give, to sell to China, to collect tea from China. So you had to change all your products that fed you for the millennia and change now to these cash crops, which had no value outside of what the British would buy from you at their price. So to come back to it, I have a concrete, when I grew up, that why he came and, and he knew why he came. So they were called uncivilized. And, and, and so even for example, in the hegemony, that man called Ram Bishun came with the Ram Charit Manas in his head. He had a text. He was called. He couldn't vote. My Nana couldn't vote until 1947. But yet, people like him were the greatest rice farmers who planted thousands of acres of land, 
imported the first tractor, imported the first uh, rice mill, yet could not vote because he was illiterate. So my Nana could talk about that. And we should note that um, the further we became quote unquote educated, the far, further we then drifted into poverty. And that's a fact of life. Mm -hmm. Very true. You raised an important point when you said we have to rectify the history and the literature. But here's the whole situation. History and literature are two of the subjects that is in least demand at this point in time. And I think this is throughout the diaspora. So how do we then decolonize in the education system when students are not choosing to study history and literature? Well, you see, this is understanding the nature of hegemony. The British first introduced English literature. This is the kicker. First introduced a subject called English literature in India. Cambridge and Oxford that were founded a thousand years before didn't teach that. Boys at Oxford and Cambridge and rugby had to learn Greek and Latin. They didn't, there was no subject called English literature. So to hegemonize India, unfortunately the, their hegemony was what is called uh, an, an uh, absolutist hegemony where you want to throw out all from the locals and put yours into the head. But they, they brought in this called literature because literature teaches you through narrative and a narrative everybody can understand. Narr in narratives, you don't even know you are being taught something there. You then empathize with the people. So when you read about Jane Eyre, you know, you don't even realize that Jane Eyre, their parents had plantations in the Caribbean and had slaves in the Caribbean. You know, you empathize with the girls of that era, or if you read Mansfield Park. So to come back to it, our leaders have to know what needs to be taught. That's why you're leaders. You need to know techniques of um, passing on it. It mightn't be literature. I wrote a, a, a little paper, and not so much, but I did my research on my great grandparents because his wife had come even earlier, 1860, from uh, West Bengal. Uh, and I have a niece in America who works for Nickelodeon. She is an animator. So we feel that I feel, and I ask her if we can animate it. Look at the song that Professor Hero showed. We'll have to find new ways of imparting the knowledge because to begin with, books aren't read. But my son who did his master's in America um, in, in, in English literature, uh, he did it on, uh, on uh, what do you call them? Uh, graphic novels. Now in my days, my nanny stopped me from reading comic books. And here's this boy who, uh, did a, a master's in graphic novels. So the thing will change now, but we have to pass on those narratives. Narratives, our history of showed each of the texts of ancient India were narratives. And it is not coincidental that the Greeks educated their people through the, the plays of Euripides and all the other uh, playwrights. Narratives is the thing. Yes, very important point. Thank you for that. Dr. Rosan Kanhai. Okay, hello. Mm -hmm. Am I unmuted? Thank you. Yes. Okay, so I have a question here. Um, well, particularly for Ravi Dave, but you know, probably some of the other the previous speakers as well. So um you spoke about, I think the the words that you used was that you were identifying nodes uh, to be decolonized, uh, areas that, um, that, that um, you know, habits and structures and that have developed that you, that you need to dismantle and rework and redesign. And I'm wondering if within those nodes, uh, you are working with, uh, um, let's say violence or exploitation or unfairness that happens within Indian communities, sometimes, um, being supported by the call for Indianness. So, you know, like Indians who have maybe more in the earlier days than now exploited other Indians, or maybe in contemporary times, Indians who um, 
convince each other to to come into activities like drug trafficking or maybe violence within Indian families and communities, you know, and sometimes those are kept secret and maintained um, because, you know, these communities or families feel a certain amount of vulnerability. Um, are you working with those sorts of issues? Roseanne, yes. And may I ask your favor, Roseanne, I've read you, I admire you and your writings and your blog back in the day. Could I see you? Uh, could you mind putting on your camera, if you don't mind? <laughs> if I can speak well, to you. Because I'm kind of walking around in my pajamas. Ah, oh, you're disheveled. You're disheveled. All right. Yeah, well, just hi, me Roseanne. No, that, that's good. My... You look you look beautiful. You look beautiful. In my disheveled um, state. So, yeah, but yes. I understand why it's easier to talk to her face because there's a real person. No, I always want to see you because I've read much of your stuff and I used to yeah. go to your blog uh, with great regularity. Yes, um, because I've been here 35 years and I look for information and data and you uh, were a great source. I think I remember a story you wrote about seeing Burnham on horseback um, as a little girl. That was you, right? Um, no, I wouldn't. Was it you? Okay. Not Burnham, no. Okay. Maybe Mine must be good. But to come back to it, absolutely, Rosa, absolutely. And what I'm doing, right now I'm doing a, a history of my village out of the logis, as we call the barracks, into the villages from the 40s to the 50s. And what we have done is to, and we are showing them with concrete examples. For example, in my family, and we don't want to hide this anymore. When Rambishun came to Guyana in 1888, he married a girl who was Guyana born. That girl's mother had come in 1860. And that girl's mother was only three. So by the time Rambishun married this girl, in 1893, that girl has been totally Guyanized. Mm. So in the family, we hear her speaking as if that she was a girl who wore shoes. She liked to dress up. You understand? And Ram Bishun, uh, coming from India, of Kurmi background, was he only knew work. And he knew a, a woman, a Kurmi woman, had to be with him in the fields. But this woman had already had a child with a different individual than Rambishun, and she never first forsook uh, that, that that child. She she always retained a connection. After a number of years with Rambishun, with Rambishun and giving three children, including my grandfather, she had the agency, the, the, the word we didn't want to use, to leave him. And mm -hmm. she returned back to the logis to live by herself. Now, this was never spoken about in my family. It was a kind of a hush-hush thing. You mm -hmm. understand? It was also hush-hush that she might have had a dalliance with some white man. You understand? Mm -hmm. So what we are saying, showing is that the Indian woman, for example, the British never kept their side of the bargain to bring an equal number of women as Gladstone promised he would in that first letter to Gillanders and others, they never kept their bargain. And at the very best overall, it was only 40% at best overall. And in the early days, it was much less than that. So they created that system of where the Indian became to show his, his authority that would then use the cutlass to beat that woman because she was using her agency. If she didn't like the way this man was treating her, she moved on. She utilized the system to empower herself and we should not be ashamed of that. My wife's great-grandmother came in that same ship with Maharani. She came in 1885. You know the ship Maharani's miseries that mm -hmm, Professor yes. Vivian Shepard wrote about? She came in that same ship when one woman was raped and killed. So she eventually married an, a, a Muslim man. She was a, a Brahmin background, they, her paper said that, but she married a, 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 Brahman, a, a Muslim Patan who was bound to my estate called Iflat. We should not hide and because nowadays you have this Muslim Hindu thing. What we are showing is that this was a common occurrence. One individual whom I just learned this last week, his father came as Bahadur in the year 1900, but he became close to the Muslims and he became a Muslim. 
He never changed his name. So all of these things that used to be, you know, said sotto voce, you know, under the, the breath, we are now bringing out. And again, the thing of violence that was reconstructed. So for example, my Nana who raised me and my Nani. My Nani was born in 1901. So she knew of indentureship, even though she wasn't indentured, but she lived in those days with the overseers. And she wouldn't take any lip from my Nana. She was the most liberated woman that I know. And she will say proudly that once when he tried to raise his hands on her, she took the, the, um, the lower her, you know, that you grind the, the, the spices mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and threw, him, threw it at him. He never tried it again. So these are things that we are talking about at the grassroots and encouraging other people to say that, for example, how the female was reconstituted out of the logis under a patriarchal premises. So for example, my mother now, who came out of the logis at the age of 16, that was the first generation that didn't have to work. And we remember our father said, well, me and mine you, you know, you get me, which is what men always say. But what we are showing now, she had 10 children. She had some chickens in the backyard, turkeys in the backyard, a chicken, a chicken, a chicken, a kitchen garden at the backyard. She went and cut rice during the crop. She was not just lolling off, waiting for some man to, to take care of her. And we got to bring these things out. So yes, Rosanne, thanks for the question, because it's a very, very important uh, uh, question that must be answered. And in that way, we are beginning to show women that they must take charge of their own destinies at the grassroots, I'm talking. I don't deal in Georgetown. I don't know you tongue girls. I, I know only country people. I live in the country and work in the country. Thank you. Thanks for your response. Yes. All right, excellent. At this point in time, 5 p.m., um, I'm just going to say thank you so much to all our speakers from for today, Mr. Ravi Dave, Mr. Sanju Hira, Mr. Irfan Polani, excellent presentations, and the discourse was even more interesting. I want to bring on Ashiria now to formally close, and Ashiria, you can go ahead and pose your question quickly too. Okay, so thank you. And um, yeah, I love hearing everyone's uh, opinions and perspectives. I think also I've kind of studied post-colonialism in university as well, and um, I think it's really interesting to bring awareness um, and that's mostly what what I think this theory or yeah perspective does. Um, and my question was kind of like, uh, even though we bring so much awareness, there is so much what we think of as normal is actually kind of from critical theory perspective is kind of already a political order. It's, it's already a Western world world view what we take as normal. It's so internalized. So how do we decolonize? Um, our mind when, for example, um, aspects in tradition like modesty and what you, what was just men mentioned, like uh, feminism, it's uh, so normalized. How do we, um, yeah, decolonize those acts aspects? First of all, if I may, uh, uh, Shashira, you are the splitting image of my daughter. And definitely that boat dropped off one of my relatives in Suriname uh, and, 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 and in Guyana. You're a spitting image. You just remark, like, I can't tell the difference looking at you from this direction. So, so first of all, yeah, it, it's all clear. And like I said, coloniality uh, still persists very, very, very strong. And it's reinforced every day. We from India, however, have an advantage that unlike Africans who were denuded of that other point of view that you can now interrogate modernity. And that, that's why their coming is called abyssal. It's an abyss, right? Abyssal coming. We are not in that abyssal. We brought some things. So for example, like me, uh, I was from a young boy, had an alternative perspective on femininity and all that. So for example, the same question you asked, I, I was interviewing the same person whose grandfather came as and he, as, as a Bahadur. And the girl was sitting in the hammock and she's a policewoman. And she was wearing uh, these torn jeans. And her mother said to her, you see, you see, you see, you, you must um, listen to Ravidev. You see how you must dress better. 
and the whole question of modesty and what is modest and so on. So I had to say modesty, of course, is contextual. And if she look at the, the, the murtis of all our goddesses, they're all naked from up. So what is modesty? You know how it is constructed in different eras and so on. So we, we, we talk about those things. So yeah, we would then deconstruct it, but we deconstruct it from using our alternative perspective that by God's grace, we were given and we retained less so because of the hegemony, but is there to be retrieved, is there. Look into it, um, my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for your answers. Um, so now to close it, I want to thank Shalima for, for being an amazing moderator as always. Thank you all for participating, taking your time, especially the speakers today. And as I has, have said earlier, um, this is a public meeting. It's being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. Uh, so feel free to contact the ICC to publish your books and reports. And remember that we are asking kindly to give us your suggestions as well as donation. Um, please contact Dr. Mahabir for details about this. Um, I want to thank the advisory and planning team led by Dr. Kumar Mahabir. Thanks to our IT manager behind the scenes, Robin Ramsing. He has been recording the program and we will upload it to our website um, and to YouTube also permanently for posterity. Our topic next Sunday will be on the life and the legacy of Padas Sagan Maharaj of Trinidad and Tobago. Please visit our YouTube channel to see all our previous recordings. I'm Rashidia Amru from the Netherlands saying goodbye. May God bless you all. Thank you. But it is Sagan Maharaj. But it is, but it is, but it is. Yes. I was I'm Dutch. Still I, I still Dutch. <laughs>